Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Dunkley. I work with Metro Vancouver, and I'm, excuse me, I'm a core member, uh, core committee member with the uh, Coquitlam River Watershed Roundtable. Uh, we're really fortunate, <coughs> excuse me, to have uh, two eminent speakers with us today. Um, and on behalf of the Coquitlam Round, uh, River Watershed Core Committee, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Rapport and Dr. Louisa Moffey. Um, Dr. Rapport is a pioneer and leading thinker in the, f in the field of ecosystem health. He has conducted research on the health of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. Uh, he has done specific projects on the Great Lakes, the Baltic Sea, the grasslands of the U.S. Southwest and, inner, and China's Inner, inner Mongolia, uh, and on agricultural landscapes in Mexico and Western Australia. His writings focus on the evaluation of the health of large-scale ecosystems, the critical importance of, of healthy ecosystems to human health and well-being, and he works on policy rele relevant indicators on the health of ecosystems and the role of biocultural diversity in sustaining healthy ecosystems. Now if that wasn't enough, then we have Dr. Louisa Maffi, who's a co-founder and director of Terra Lingua, which is an international NGO devoted to sustaining biocultural diversity. Uh, Louisa is an, also an adjunct professor at uh, Royal Roads uh, in the Faculty of Social and Applied Sciences. Uh, she has pioneered the concept of biocultural diversity, which is the interconnectedness and interdependence of biological, uh, cultural, and linguistic diversity. So she, she merges all three there and plays a leading role in the integrative, integrative field of knowledge and action on, in this field. Her field work has taken her to Somalia, Mexico, China, Japan, and all through British Columbia working with First Nations peoples. So if you please welcome uh, David and, and Louisa. Thank you for, uh, to uh, all of you uh, in the round table and uh, participants for being here. Um, David and I come as a duo because we are partners in life and work. Uh, when we came together as a couple, we also began to bring together our respective fields and uh, seek an even uh, larger integration of uh, the aspects of the health uh, of the environment and the health and well-being of people, uh, meaning not only uh, human health but also our social uh, and uh, cultural and psychological uh, health and uh, that's uh, what we're gonna uh, touch on today but uh, David will start uh, first of all with uh, a few slides to um, to introduce uh, our perspective on uh, what it takes to manage for healthy uh, watersheds and uh, so I'll uh, uh, pass the microphone uh, on to him first. Thank you. It's, uh, as Louisa said, it's a real pleasure for us to be here. We look forward to interacting with you. Uh, it's great to see communities like this getting really serious about the uh, health of their ecosystems. Uh, there's a lot of doom and gloom out there, but it's not too late. If one does get really serious, a lot can be done. And uh, of course, the time, is, the time is now. A number of years ago, there was in, in the uh, Inland Center for Waters, uh, the CCIW, Canadian Center for Inland Waters, a uh, banner that said, ecosystem health is everybody's business. And that's really true. It should be everybody's business. Unfortunately, we're in, still in an era, 30 years after that banner went up, when it's not really everybody's business. There's a schism between those people that really care about the environment and the way the, our business and economic system is organized. So uh, we really find that the health of ecosystems inevitably, uh, unfortunately, takes a back seat to the health of the corporations, the businesses, the economy, and that's what you hear about most. And in all of the political around the world discussions, what comes up most is let's grow, growing the economy and how much is that economy growing. 
On the bright side, you're hearing more and more. Uh, recently, uh, the new Prime Minister of India said he's going to make it a priority to clean up the Ganges. So that's, you are hearing some talk that's not, is introducing a little bit about the environment matters. And of course, we know where there's no water, there's no life, so the connection is very intimate, and people are waking up to that reality. And it may mean, as Modi suggested, the tanneries along the Ganges have to go. So that it's no longer trade-offs. Well, I think we're going to say we have to say what contributes to the health of ecosystems and what destroys it. Make some hard choices if we want life uh, instead of uh, an economy that in a lifeless environment, which won't last very long. Uh, this first um, uh, slide here just really situates. Uh, the health of our own health within the health of ecosystems. I mean, it's obvious that uh, there's a concentric circles there. We live within an ecosystem, and uh, what affects us is all of that, our families and our communities and uh, society and, of course, the state of the ecosystems. And that's what you've been uh, dealing with right here. So it's no news to you that if you have a watershed that's compromised, it's going to come back and affect your health and your life in many ways, not just through the contaminants, but through the availability of food supplies uh, and also the uh, presence of pathogens. One of the things we've learned in ecosystems is that ecosystems that are highly disturbed are more uh, conducive to carrying human pathogens around the world in all kinds of situations. We've seen this close up. Next slide. Uh, this is just a kind of boring diagram, but trying to put together that whole nexus of pressures, states, responses, um, and really talk about what contributes to ecosystem health. What is ecosystem health? It's, uh, when you talk about a river, it's obviously a very dynamic situation, has a lot of seasonality, um, and in terms of what's there and in terms of the hydrology of the river. But ecosystems uh, fundamentally uh, ease, have a certain characteristic biodiversity or organization, and a compromised system has a much, much less of that. We can certainly see in the extreme cases the difference between health and no health. Many of the world's rivers are running dry, so by the time they get to the delta, you see deserts instead of a thriving uh, aquatic ecosystem that's full of, uh, with a tremendously large biodiversity. So endpoints are easy to see. If you go to uh, even a grassland and you see sand, you know that system, that ecosystem has really no longer functional. The endpoints are easy to see. The beginning of degradation is a little more difficult, confusing because, of course, ecosystems are so dynamic. Things are come and go and are disappearing and coming back again. And one never knows at any one point of time, is this just a normal dynamic or the beginning of a long-term trend when something goes missing? Uh, Ecosystems are vital, have a lot of vitality, they're dynamic, you can understand if, they, if the uh, salmon are not coming back in the numbers they had before, there's something wrong there. The vitality of that ecosystem is being compromised. And ecosystems have resilience. A resilient ecosystem is one that can bounce back. We have floods and we're going to see a lot more floods and droughts and our ecosystems are going to be tested because we've got another thing going on in our concentric circles, what's going on in the biosphere, which is affecting all of our ecosystems. And, uh, but how, resilient ecosystems have more capability for bouncing back than, than, than otherwise. And when you talk about spatial and uh, temporal aspects of ecosystem dynamics, we, I heard this morning the presentation is the lower Coquitlam watershed. But that must be connected to an upper Coquitlam watershed. And what's going on in that upper Coquitlam watershed has a very profound effect on what's going on in the lower Coquitlam watershed. So one needs to be aware. We can't deal with the whole world at once. One needs to be aware of the major factors that are impacting what you're trying to preserve and protect. Next. Um, I've been fortunate to be involved in assessing environments for a long time. Uh, the uh, way back uh, in my history, after I gave up my promising career looking at the life and, and love of uh, protozoa <laughs> under a microscope, 
at Simon Fraser University, where I had the most, one of the most beautiful labs at Simon Fraser in the early 70s, uh, overlooking the North Shore Mountains. Uh, Statistics Canada came by and said, we want somebody that has a background in ecology, that I did my postdoctoral work in ecology, and a background in economics, which I, where I did my doctoral, doctoral work. work. So, uh, they didn't have much to choose from. They just had to take what they could find, and that was me. They sw whisked me away to Ottawa, so instead of peering into a microscope and looking at a droplet and seeing how the protozoa were interac interacting with each other, I went to Ottawa and they said, tell us how this whole ec e economy and all of the ecologies of Canada are interacting with each other and what's going on here. That was a big stretch. So from a water droplet to all of Canada, I was set upon a task to evaluate the uh, environment of Canada. At that time, environment was looked at mostly in terms of the purity of it, you know, the quality of water, the quality of land. Uh, basically, how was it contaminated or not? Well, it's a much bigger picture than that, and over time we developed actually very quickly what's known widely as the pressure state response system. We're identifying the major pressures and the, drive, the drivers that drive the pressures, that is the specific kinds of industrial activities and other and human activities. Uh, we all are involved in pressuring the ecosystem one way or another. If we drive cars or build houses or disturb the landscape, anyway, the drivers, the pressures that come from those activities and how they impact ecosystem functions. What's going on with the ecosystem? Are we, are we compromising the diversity of life forms? Are we uh, over uh, nutrifying the system, which is a problem common in watersheds, and that kind of thing. Well, we produced the first State of the Environment report in Canada in 1986, and the then Minister of the Environment, Bob McMillan, applauded it. We thought it was just going to go into the recycling bin immediately. He, he, he was a new minister. He was looking for something to champion. He really liked what he saw, promoted it, said in Parliament this was done by an unfettered report by two senior scientists, my partner Peter Bird, a radiation biologist with Health Canada, uh, was the co-author and co-director of this project. And uh, so it, Parliament mandated that you, we repeat this every five years. Not us. We were worn out from the first one, but other teams came in to play. They made a whole big uh, bureaucracy out of it. And it got more and more fettered. The reports got more and more fettered. Went another two cycles until the government of Canada said, we don't like what we see here. The first one was bad enough, and the second one was worse, and the third one was worse. That is, the conditions of the environment were de declining. And that, for uh, reasons that I don't really understand, they felt the public shouldn't know anymore. And, those, and after 1996, we don't have any further state of environment reports for Canada, unfortunately. But other organizations, the um, Millennium Assessment, which is done by the UN, has picked up this framework and has worked for, further to talk about the conditions of the environments around the world. Uh, I've been working with the uh, Baltic Sea for some time. Uh, I didn't write the Helsinki Commission report uh, in 2010. I didn't put the title on it or anything, but I was asked to, to review it. And that's a report looking at the health of the Baltic Sea, going back uh, three decades and looking at the pressures and the response and what's happened. Next. And this is what they came up with. Very nice graphics and uh, really uh, delving into the different aspects, you know, what this is the biodiversity. The Baltic, as you might know, is one of the most polluted seas in the world because it's a very almost nearly totally landlocked sea. There's a narrow channel through the uh, Danish Straits that goes out to the North Sea and then out to the world's oceans. But it's um, heavily influenced by what goes on in its watershed. So these pictures show that eutrophication, that is the amount of um, nutrients in the water which drive algal blooms is extreme because of that extreme nutrient concentration. The Baltic Sea has the distinction of being the world's largest dead zone. Uh, that is because the uh, heavy algal blooms when they settle down to the bottom waters, uh, feed bacteria which use the oxygen up in the bottom waters and it becomes deoxygenated. There's a lot of hazardous substances in the Baltic and then you can see that, that through some magic they put all of these different dimensions about what's going on biologically and ecologically and hydrologically into a health status and what it shows is it's poor to, uh, you know, moderate, moderately unhealthy to very unhealthy, particularly in the central Baltic region. Next. 
Um, taking data, and I've been involved in this, on the watershed of the Baltic is a little ha is hazardous in itself. And that's not atypical. I've been there and it's an, it's an experience. Next. Next slide. Um, well, health and human well-being are interlinked. My partner is just uh, pulling on my sweater here, which means I have to give her some air time. <laughs> David sure likes to talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess I can go fairly quickly through all this because uh, I noticed with uh, great pleasure that uh, these connections between the health of ecosystems and human health and well-being are no strangers to you. And uh, I also uh, really uh, cheered when I heard that uh, you have identified uh, cultural values and, and uh, uh, prevailing cultural norms as uh, as one of the factors or, or pressures um, so you are ahead of the curve really as a, as a community group and I want to congratulate congratulate you for this uh, but uh, th there's no question that uh, whatever happens in our ecosystems and uh, of course in, in our watersheds as uh, as critical ecosystems uh, has uh, an impact on on our health and well-being and uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, we've known for a long time about um, issues with uh, air quality, air pollution, uh, and uh, its impact on on human health. Um, the World Health, Health Organization uh, keep releasing uh, really startling figures about uh, how many premature deaths uh, a year there are uh, due to just that. Maybe seven million was the latest figure. Um, uh, worldwide uh, per year. Uh, water quality and quantity, uh, I don't need to tell you. Uh, here's an illustration uh, from uh, some of the work, field work that we have done uh, on, on the right uh, in the Sierra Taumara, northern Mexico, uh, where uh, water scarcity is uh, a serious problem. Um, and also the water is uh, becoming increasingly polluted. And so we were helping there with uh, uh, the development of alternatives, uh, bringing water from a uh, uh, non-polluted uh, mountain stream. All of that, of course, has uh, a strong impact on food and uh, the ability to, to, to grow enough food uh, and therefore food security for uh, people uh, all around uh, the world. And, uh, you know, the many other benefits of biodiversity and, and uh, healthy ecosystems have already been mentioned, so I don't need to uh, go over that again. Uh, next. Uh, how did we come to this point uh, in Canada and, uh, and and worldwide? How, how do we come? Uh, did we come to the point of degrading our uh, ecosystems, uh, the health of our ecosystems, uh, to such an extent uh, that uh, really uh, globally we we are uh, increasingly experiencing uh, one environmental crisis after the other? Um, well, once upon a time, we, we were uh, much more integrated with uh, our local environments. Uh, in fact, David didn't tell uh, the story uh, of when he was um, uh, beginning the work on the uh, State of Environment Report for Canada, and they had to develop a mapping of uh, Canada's ecozones uh, divided up by their ecological character characteristics, di dividing up uh, Canada by ecological characteristics rather than by provinces, because of course political borders are meaningless for, from an ecological point of view. And then he went to the uh, Museum of Civilizations in Ottawa and saw a map on the wall and said, oh, who put the map, map of ecozones uh, in the museum? And it wasn't. It was a map showing the distribution of Canadian First Nations and it was almost identical. So people, uh, once upon a time, did organize themselves by, uh, by ecozones, by watersheds. It was the natural thing to do because uh, you had all of the resources that you needed right there. Um, and this is uh, an example from uh, one of the BC First Nations that uh, I have worked with, the Saanich people uh, in the Saanich Peninsula and uh, that's what the uh, marvelous uh, elder uh, David Elliott had to say. 
uh, about how, how people thought of themselves, uh, the whole cycle of life uh, as represented in that uh, Saanich uh, calendar uh, is, it was entirely arranged around uh, the passage of time over the year and uh, different activities uh, that uh, were conducted depending on, uh, on the seasons. But uh, it's no longer that way, unfortunately. Next, please. And uh, again, from some of our field work, that's uh, that some of the uh, consequences in the Sierra Tarumara uh, in northern Mexico, uh, the whole landscape should look like uh, that picture of the uh, Urique River uh, Valley. But in fact, uh, most of what you see is, uh, as in the lower picture, uh, the, the, uh, the whole landscape has been denuded by uh, over-harvesting uh, of, of uh, uh, of trees, uh, reducing the land down to bedrock in, in, in many places. Uh, in, in Mongolia, in northern China, uh, where we have also worked, uh, what you should see is thriving and lush grasslands like that. What we did see uh, is essentially desert. Uh, the, the grasslands uh, were uh, originally um, uh, only used uh, b by nomadic herders uh, who, who moved with the seasons again, uh, allowing for the grass to regenerate uh, after they had grazed in one place. Uh, but the replacement of that with uh, sedentary agriculture has has caused uh, the um, desertification that, that you can now see. Uh, the land just wasn't suited for uh, that kind of intensive use. Uh, and even in our BC forests, of course, we see uh, fewer and fewer uh, big trees trees in old growth and more and more uh, clear cuts and uh, kind of spindly uh, second growth. Um, so that's uh, th that's what ha has happened because we, we have lost that, that uh, um, interconnectedness with the environments in which we live and the, the awareness of what it takes to live in balance with uh, our, our local environments. Next. And uh, of course, in our work, we, we, we have been involved in trying to uh, do what possible to uh, revert that process and to uh, help uh, restore and reintegrate aquacultural health, again, from some, uh, our work in uh, Inner Mongolia and in the Sierra Tarahumara, uh, trying to advise in, uh, in Inner Mongolia our fellow scientists in, uh, in the Sierra Tarahumara, uh, local indigenous communities uh, about um, how to restore the uh, the health of their ecosystems, and uh, it was precisely in our work in in uh, uh, northern Mexico that uh, we heard. The most touching thing that we have heard um, probably in all of our work uh, is, is said by a uh, Tarahumara elder, uh, Erasmus, seen in the picture on the right. Uh, he came up to us uh, and he was really happy uh, that we were there and he said through the work that uh, we were doing, uh, we were uh, creating an awakening. Uh, and really what he meant was a reawakening because then he added, we are beginning to remember things that uh, we once knew but we had forgotten how to live uh, in, uh, in balance with our environment and how, uh, w what kind of uh, practices uh, are, uh, uh, were supporting that, uh, that kind of balance. Uh, so that was a, uh, a really memorable uh, lesson for us. Next. And uh, w with that, I will uh, pass the uh, microphone back to David for some concluding remarks. <coughs> Thank you, Louisa. I, I think of that point uh, and the one of the pressures you identified here, apathy, really comes from that lack of understanding of the integration, the importance of integration for life. And uh, as we lose that, um, then you lose, uh, lose the understanding of the integration of humans within nature. We all tend, as urbanization catches on more and more, we tend to be more isolated from nature. Uh, and uh, then it's easy to see how apathy can come into doing something about nature because people have really forgotten how important that is for life itself. Um, and I think that another point that we really want to take note of, and I've seen this time and time again, the Great Lakes, 
It's a really important uh, watershed for all of North America. Some more than 40 million people depend on its uh, health for their health. And there have been concerted efforts going way back to the International Joint Commission's work on boundary waters, that's the US and Canada, on the Great Lakes going back four decades. Identifying the pressures, identifying the condition of the water. These are scientific studies. I've participated in some of the uh, data collection on the Great Lakes, on, on the various cruise vessels. A little um, less rough than the, than the Baltic scene, but it also has its challenges. Um, and anyway, from a scientific point of view, really understanding the processes, the multiple pressures on the Great Lakes and what's happening to that ecosystem and how it affects us. And of course, now you've all heard about the Asian carp that are knocking on the door, coming and threatening to, uh, to derail the whole thing. Well, there's more than the Asian carp knock knocking on the door. The Great Lakes, the state of the Great Lakes today is in worse condition than it was 40 years ago. And people were thinking, oh, this improving. First you heard the Lake Erie's dying, then oh, it's not dying so much, but it's coming back, and it slipped back to where it is, and it's worse than it's ever been. This is after billions, hundreds of billions of dollars spent on looking at areas of concern and trying to do something about it. So the message there is you can never relax vil uh, your, dil your uh, diligence and your, um, uh, never feel relaxed about uh, uh, what you've accomplished, it's great to move forward, but constant vigilance is really critical. Otherwise, it's so easy to slip back. And the other thing one has to keep in mind is the pressures when they're in conflict with the health of the ecosystems. A lot of people talk about trade-offs. Let's do a little of this, let's do a little of that. It can work in some situations, and in some situations you just have to draw the line. Certain pressures are just not compatible with restoring or maintaining the health of your watersheds. And it would be nice to identify those and see how, what are you going to do about it. And that gets to the whole point I wanted to make at the beginning. We are getting better and better at explaining how ecosystems are degrading and dying. We've made tremendous progress. We document the pressures and we're getting very, very good at it, both from a citizen science, which I guess this is more orientated here on the Coquitlam side, and from the uh, professional science side. Really can dig in and all kinds of papers and journals are coming out with new articles every week on how to better document scientifically the pressures and the impacts they're having on this or that ecosystem. So we're getting really good with the knowledge base. It has real value in terms of being able to do state of environment reports with more authority because we're drawing on those knowledge bases, but we're missing one thing. One whole set of knowledge base is not really being approached. I think a little bit, I heard a little bit of it in the presentation this morning, so you're making a beginning. That's action indicators. Actions that really, where you can measure the progress you're making to reduce the pressures that are degrading your ecosystem. We've been very good at recording the state of the system and the pressures on it, but what flows from that? What's the human response? What are the indicators of what it means to your health and well-being? What are the indicators of how you're going to then attack those drivers and reduce those pressures? Where are the indicators of reduced pressure? Where are the goals? What, what are the timelines for making progress and monitoring it? This is not a failing in any one place. This is a universal failing. We've spent a lot of time on the pressure state response system, developing it, but we've mostly focused on explaining things. We have not focused enough on drawing the connection between what we're finding, what's practical to be done about it, and how much progress we're making in doing that. If we had done more of that in the Great Lakes, we might have not have seen the backtracking we've seen uh, in the Great Lakes. So there's a real challenge there. It's not easy. I'm aware, having been steeped in uh, econo business, engineering, and economics for all too long, before I got into life sciences, I was in the lifeless sciences. And uh, there's no faculty of lifeless sciences, but uh, there, <laughs> nobody really wants to call it that. It's an, it's an important part of our community to understand our economy. It's, it does a lot of wonderful things for us. But if we don't connect it to the life sciences, 
we're getting into a mess, as we know. And, uh, and that's where the f another big challenge is, how to better connect the lifeless sciences, I won't call it that, the economics, the business, the engineering knowledge that we have with what it is doing to life itself. And if it's compromising life, we need to rethink that. And how can we get an economics and an engineering and a business that puts life first? And I'd like to end on that message. Thank you. Uh, we, we do have time for questions. Uh, we've got 10 or 15 minutes if anybody has any questions. Or do you want to throw out questions to them? Or either way works. Mm -hmm. Is there a prize for the first question? <laughs> <laughs> there we got a question. Yeah. Yes. You were talking about how we know all the information about how problems are arising. In the current atmosphere coming from Ottawa where no one's allowed to talk. Mm-hmm. What was the last one? What are your thoughts on all that Oh, what are the thoughts on it? Well, I, I think it's a very... Uh, unfortunate situation that uh, uh, the, the, the political uh, process is not really listening to this. They come from a different mindset. Uh, I was just talking with one of the outstanding uh, senators in, and uh, major business prime mover of Canada a few weeks ago in Toronto. Uh, uh, and uh, we had a, a wonderful hour and a half chat. We've been friends for an awful long time. I was asking him what his fellow business people think of all the dire warnings coming from the uh, International Panel on Climate Change and the WHO and, and also. He said, look, we just don't believe it. It just doesn't seem that way from where we're sitting on the 30th floor of this or that tower. Money is good. The economy is good, life is good, technology is coming around the corner or even unbelievable, just blowing, you, blowing us, even us away. So it's a matter of a, they just do not see or want to see that side of things. They want to deny it. And again, having come from an economics business background, I can also see many of our uh, parliamentarians come from those backgrounds. And when you're indoctrinated in that, it's really tough to get outside that closed system. Yeah, that's right, exactly. The blinders are on, unfortunately. Other question, yes. Um, I have two questions. One is, do you have any rapport with any other people with economic backgrounds? Are there any like-thinking people uh, with that background? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like-thinking in terms of in, in the importance of the environment? Yes. Yes, there's a whole international society, actually, which I helped to found, the, Interna the uh, International Society for Ecological Economics, and that's a whole group of economists and ecologists trying to put together uh, these two uh, disciplines which have a lot to say to each other. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, I think that they have put the uh, juxtaposition of economy and, e and environment upside down. They have tried to put ecological, economic values on ecology. We should put ecological values on economy. But anyway, they've tried their best uh, to, to try to integrate that, and there's a lot of interest by economists in, in, uh, in measuring the impacts on society of economic activity, the impacts on, on the uh, environment, but they're trying to put dollar signs on it. I think that's not really, uh, n neither intellectually, uh, academically convincing, but I don't think it's helpful in terms of our attitude. We've got to start thinking about life and putting life signs on our economic activity. <laughs> and, and the second part would follow is we would need then politicians who are the scientists uh, who are from the biology uh, background rather than the economic background. Well, I, I can certainly comment on that. I've interacted a lot. I've spent 21 years in Ottawa uh, working as the science advisor to Stat Statistics Canada. Um, and uh, had the occasion to meet many of the uh, ministers and parliamentarians in Ottawa at the time. And uh, they, the ones that do understand 
were a, were a handful at that time. Karen Kraft Sloan comes to mind, uh, Clifford Lincoln comes to mind, uh, Charles Katia comes to mind. We're talking a few years ago. These were, and others, these were leaders, great parliamentarians, fantastic speeches, really knowledgeable, and they pushed and pushed, but they were just uh, the, the, the lone wolf pack in the wilderness kind of thing. They just couldn't get across to their fellow colleagues how important this was because they probably, those colleagues see it like my friend in Toronto, the business tycoon, that uh, this is just, you know, making too much out of it. You know, we don't believe it's really that important. The most important things are the economy and jobs. But as an American leader of the uh, of union, union, the Amer uh, one of the big unions said, no jobs for a dead planet. So we really have to connect back to the life systems. And I guess I, I could add something here. I guess uh, a key challenge that we have here to, to change this situation is one of education. Precisely for the for, for the reason that, that David mentioned, joking about the life and the lifeless sciences, uh, we need much more integrative education in which. Uh, uh, Anybody, uh, you know, an economist cannot get an, an economics degree without uh, learning about the life sciences and so on and so forth, uh, and and vice versa. Of course, uh, you know, as as uh, uh, life scientists, so we can't dream pipe dreams, uh, forgetting that people have to live and and, and have decent livelihoods. Uh, but but of course, uh, overarching all this is really a reconsideration of our cultural values. Uh, what does matter? most uh, in our lives uh, what, what uh, will really make us happy uh, you know uh, uh, that does a decent life uh, only mean pursuing economic success uh, or, or are there other values that could be overarching and uh, uh, lead us to to rethink uh, how we do things and uh, lead us to uh, come back into balance with uh, our ecosystems Another question, yes. Oh, that's a good question. That's that's the that's the billion dollar question. Can we? Uh, is it possible to repair our ecosystems, uh, recover our ecosystems, and still maintain our standard of living? Um, I, I think that, uh, first of all, let's be realistic. Is it possible to recover our own health when it gets to a certain critical point? Uh, with our current knowledge, that's not possible. We find it equally true in ecosystems. There's not a magic for, for um, restoring ecosystems after they've come to some critical tipping points, unfortunately. Uh, but, there, we got that because we've crossed many tipping points doesn't mean we have to cross many more. So one can certainly hold the line on where we are and there are some good stories about restoring lakes and watersheds and riparian vegetation and so on that are a very positive direction. So we don't want to get over, overly optimistic, but there are a number of, of situations where improvements can be made. Now does that cut into our way of life? To be perfectly uh, frank, it might. Uh, I, but if we consider our way of life in, in the traditional terms of the way we're living and we want everything we're doing, but if we consider our lives in another way, uh, getting satisfaction and living in a healthy environment, I would think our living standards can go up while we do improve the environment. So it is a tough one. Um, to, because you have to recognize that everything we do comes from the earth. It's not just what we can buy and pay for on a credit card. So if we go and pull out all the stops and just continue to be the consumer societies that we're known for around the world, North Americans are known for, and now the Chinese are being coming known for, and the Chinese dream means all the Chinese people to do a good job must be great consumers, we are overpowering the possibilities for the planet to sustain life. And so that's a sad reality, but it doesn't have to be sad if you look at it in a different way. As Louisa says, what are our values? What really is meaningful to us? Is it consuming or is it living in a healthy environment, in a healthy community, and in good health ourselves? And, and as part of the really integrating ourselves with the planetary ecosystems. 
Uh, I have a question, and, and it has, I'm over here, you're looking, uh, for, for, uh, for you, and that is how do we do with, deal with the elephant in the room, which is the, the human population pressure on the earth? We deal with this in our own communities, and when we're told we think we live in a nice community, but we have to grow more all the time, uh, and, and the earth is dealing with it. We are overwhelmed with the burden of supporting you know, so many people in the future. I, I do worry about that very much. Well, what's, what's your solution? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, it's one of the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the, um, I say uh, conundrums that as uh, that I run into all the time. What's your solution? What's your suggestion to problems that seem intractable? Uh, the I was reading a uh, advertisement by the National. Uh, Committee on Population that was published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1998. I was catching up on my reading. <laughs> <laughs> and they were imploring uh, their fellow North Americans. This was uh, the Atlantic Monthly, mostly uh, the U.S. based publication. They're fellow Americans, but they said other countries do, uh, to consider that we're, they're already overpopulated and the only po appropriate population would be to degrowth and depopulate because otherwise we risk overwhelming our resources, our renewable resources, and compromising life. A statement couldn't be more, I couldn't agree with more. What's happened since 1998 is our population is growing ahead by, you know, um, a, a billion people every 10 years or so, slightly less, 800 million added net every 10 years, and we're headed, according to the UN, for about 11 billion people. And it's not just the people, it's the consumption that those people require, so that the economy will have to, and the food supplies will have to double by 2050. And some of the best agrarian scientists really don't know if that's possible. And of course, so we are really, a, it is an extremely critical problem, and it used to be one more talked about, now it seems to be not politically correct to talk about it. And mo many countries where populations are falling, like in Korea, and uh, which has one of the lowest uh, fertility rates in the world, and Japan, and China, uh, well, they're now trying to implore their citizens to produce more offspring, you know, to take care of them in their old age. So uh, it, is a, it is a conundrum uh, which uh, does not, unfortunately, have a, a, an easy solution, but it's a critical problem, absolutely critical. I can, yeah, I can add something to this. Uh, I think that ultimately the key to addressing the uh, population problem and probably uh, the reason why it hasn't been uh, addressed um, in spite of you know many conferences on, on population uh, a few decades ago is that uh, as population in certain countries began to fall, uh, government and, and industry realize, oh, we're losing our workforce. Uh, we're losing also uh, the younger people who will pay for social security for the older people, and so on and so forth. And so they started scrambling to actually reverse a trend that was positive for uh, our sustainability, planetary sustainability. So the key to resolving the population problem, I think, is in our economic models. And, uh, and until we, we can replace a model of endless uh, uh, economic growth uh, with something that is more sustainable in terms of uh, planetary limits, we will also not resolve the population problem. But if we identify that as the key problem, then we can at least begin to address it in a serious way. Um. And I've just added a little postscript to that. Uh, my mentor and later close friend, Kenneth Boulding, who was a distinguished um, an American economist, there's his uh, take on things, on growth in a finite world. He's a, he had a great sense of humor. Of course, what he's saying is that this is, you know, preposterously on the wrong track. And we do have to come to some recognition of that, that we have a finite planet and finite resources. Now in economics, of course, resources is connected to technology. So it's not just what's there, but what's accessible in an economic way. But still, there's a finite to it, finiteness to it. And we are, by all of the metrics, 
way over the sustainability rate of our planet have been for three decades or so, two or three decades. So we were just uh, have to really put children to the wheel and population is a huge you know, thing that we have to rethink and as Louisa said, there's reasons why it's being more, uh, less, more downplayed now because uh, the economists and uh, people that run the government understand that it has an economic, it's an economic hit if we don't uh, rev up the populations and keep them going. Yes? Well, it's easy to say we've got to change, but how are we going to do it? I foresee we're going to have a lot of civic unrest and maybe even wars and revolutions over this. Well, you uh, uh, really hit the nail on the head there. Albert Schweitzer, if you look at his introduction to that beautiful book that Rachel Carson wrote, Silent Spring, Al, Al, she actually used a quote from Albert Schweitzer who said that, you know, we will, it'll end badly because, uh, <laughs> because we, are, we are going to destroy everything. Now that is a possibility, but we have other possibilities. And Louisa and I are writing a book together, a joint book. <laughs> It's one, and we are putting out a different perspective. Uh, it's, it's a book of hope, despite all this. Uh, I, I believe we, we are, the, we, since we're the problem, and, and it's the way we think about things, we have a, uh, the possibility of changing our thinking and, uh, and doing things differently. But that will take some recognitions and understandings, and, and it's unclear what the future will be. But all, all, all one can do is try to get uh, uh, the larger perspective of life and, and really ask ourselves deeply if we care about life there are certain <laughs> actions that are uh, that we can take which would be consistent with that but uh, you're you know uh, I, I, many people are pessimistic about the future uh, and many people are optimistic about the future so <laughs> we'll have to just see how it unfolds and do the best we can and I, I certainly again want to thank you for this opportunity to be here and for your interest and for your energy and and dedication to doing what you can do in your backyard and we have to realize that what we do in our backyards is really the, the global backyard we're an interconnected world and so thank you for all that